The real problem the banking sector had and still has, and it's not gone away, is the problem of borrowing short term. That is, they take money from their depositors and they have to repay them at, at notice and lending long term. The, the banks have got this situation that they have short term depositors who they have to repay at notice and they have these long term loans which they can't get back at, at short notice. If the difference is greater than their capital and reserves, then the bank is insolvent and some sort of action needs to be taken. Clive Thompson's career focused on wealth management, particularly in Swiss private banking, granting him valuable expertise in central banking. In a recent discussion, he delved into topics including the absence of a banking crisis in 2023, potential risks ahead, government's fiscal challenges juxtaposed with growing wealth elsewhere, unexpected inflation persistence, financial repression, the role of precious metals, and other pertinent issues. Regional banks have been scrutinized more closely after Silicon Valley Bank's collapse, which was prompted by high borrowing costs that exceeded its income from low-rate loans following the Federal Reserve's aggressive rate hikes since March 2022. Many banks have unrealized losses on securities portfolios, including mortgage-backed paper. Thompson suggests that a major banking crisis isn't on the horizon, reflecting both current and recent trends. He highlights the ongoing challenge in the banking sector, the mismatch between short-term borrowing and long-term lending practices. Signs of stress in the commercial real estate market have also emerged in recent months, with several high-profile buildings selling for far less than their previous market value. The regional banks are highly exposed to commercial real estate lending, and property developers need to roll over $930 billion in maturing loans this year. An IMF insider is warning of another U.S. banking crisis amid hot inflation, dwindling hope of interest rate cuts from the Fed, and fears of a mounting crisis in the real estate market. Thompson notes that long-term loans with fixed interest rates may not match banks' low returns on investments like government bonds, given historically low interest rates. This mismatch, combined with depositors seeking higher returns elsewhere and employee reluctance to return to work, significantly affects the commercial real estate market. Let's delve into the video to gain further insights. Before we begin, consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon to stay updated with the latest content. I don't think we are facing a major banking crisis, nor were we uh, a year ago. We were facing some defaults, uh, and there'd be less than I expected. Uh, I think we will see some American banking failures going forwards, particularly the smaller regional banks, which are focused on mortgages. Uh, the The real problem the banking sector had and still has, and it's not gone away, is the problem of borrowing short term, that is, they take money from their depositors and they have to repay them at, at notice, and lending long term. So when they lend long term, they've done two types, two or three types of things. The first one is the mortgages. So these mortgages will be 5, 10, 20, 30 years, depends on the country. Uh, I think in America, it's quite long term mortgages. In the UK, it's much shorter where they fix it maybe for four or five years. Uh, the second thing is they're lending to corporations who quite obviously can't immediately pay where they borrowed money to buy a factory or whatever they're doing. Uh, so that, to all intents and purposes, is long-term lending. And typically, corporations will want to have a fixed interest rate for a number of years, so they, they'll have fixed the interest rate there. And the uh, third type of lending they'll have done, now all of that will have happened over the last decade uh, when interest rates were as close to zero as makes no difference, which means the interest rate that they are earning on these fixed interest loans is quite low. Uh, certainly it's lower than what they have to pay their depositors to keep the money in the bank. Now, many depositors don't care, they're leaving their money and earning nothing. But realistically speaking, there's an ongoing movement by depositors to say, you know, I can get 5% in a money market fund, I'm taking my money out of here, and I'm going to put it in a money market fund. And the money market fund would be putting their money in the USA, for example, with the Federal Reserve, where they can get 5% and completely safely. Uh, so the, the banks have got this situation that they have short-term depositors who they have to repay at notice, and they have these long-term loans which they can't get back at, at short notice. Uh, they are if they sell their liquid assets, which are the treasury bonds that, that they'll own, they're going to be selling them at below the price they paid, which is a loss. And the the problem with this is to what uh, with banks is to what extent are the losses that banks have made on these treasury bonds, on their loans, on their commercial real estate loans, on all the loans they made, to what extent are those assets, because they are assets of the bank, whether the bank lends money, 
to what extent are those assets worth less than the deposits, their liabilities that they've taken in? Um, if the difference is greater than their capital reserves, then the bank is insolvent and some sort of action needs to be taken. Um, and that might mean it goes into administration and the Federal Reserve deposit, uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation steps in and provides compensation for the investors who want their money out. And maybe the, the bank gets taken over by a larger bank. But so the, the problem is out there. And the I think the, the growing problem is in the arena of the commercial real estate market. Uh, we're seeing that there's a continuing reluctance of employees to go back to work. Regulators are acting to require U.S. banks to build a sturdier financial base to lessen the risk that they could collapse and cause a global meltdown. Under a rule that regulators adopted Tuesday, the eight biggest banks will have to meet stricter measures for holding capital, money that provides a cushion against unexpected losses. The Federal Reserve, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Treasury's Office of the Comptroller of the Currency independently voted to mandate banks to increase their minimum capital ratio to loans from the existing 3% to 5%. Thompson suggests that the Federal Reserve is plunging deeper into insolvency, driven by a prolonged phase of paying notably higher interest rates to their depositors. Looking ahead, Thompson predicts a forthcoming shift in the interest rate landscape. He anticipates that short-term rates may decrease while longer-term rates could rise. This forecast is partially propelled by the Treasury's vested interest in lowering interest rates. Now, let's redirect our attention to a video. The Federal Reserve is getting deeper and deeper into the insolvency hole. They are, they're very insolvent at the moment due to the fact that for more than a year, they have been paying much higher interest rates to their depositors, that's the banks and the money market funds who deposit money with the Federal Reserve, than they're earning on the book of treasuries that they bought over the last decade when interest rates were much lower. So they're now well over a trillion dollars uh, in uh, losses because of unusual rules at the Federal Reserve and the accounting book, which they have written themselves, by the way. They're allowed to call losses assets. That's official. Now, if any corporate, any company was to call a loss an asset, uh, that would be criminal and the directors would go to jail. But that is legally allowed. It's in the um, uh, Federal Reserve's accounting manual, which I've I've read the relevant section. Um, and that accounting manual is written by the board of directors or approved by the board of directors themselves. Uh, but if there were a, if they were a company, they'd be deeply insolvent and have, probably have to go into administration. But that's uh, or or bankruptcy or, insol or insolvency or bankruptcy. But that's not the case with the Federal Reserve. And we mustn't forget that in theory, they have the ability to build print unlimited amounts of money. Um, it's not as simple as that. But I, I give that sort of very generically. Uh, but the the reality is, it's going to take a long time for them to recover their insolvency. And the only way, or the main way, to recover the insolvency would be to lower short term rates so that the short-term rates are lower than the interest they're earning on their book of treasury bonds. But even then, if they do that, that'll take a very long time to recover. Or the alternative is to wait for another decade or so as their book of treasury bonds and uh, notes mature and they reinvest them at the new higher rates. But that still only works if we have a positive yield curve, i.e. bond yields are higher than the short-term interest rate. And that's not the case today. Uh, it probably will be the case, I think, probably before the end of this year, because I think it's not the short-term rates which will come down so much, it's more the longer-term rates which will rise. And the reason they're going to rise is the second uh, party who has an interest in lower interest rates, and that's the Treasury. Now, the Treasury is the arm of the government which borrows money when the government spends more money than it collects in taxes. And that's what the government has been doing almost forever, but certainly to a huge extent since the 2008 crisis and even more so as a result of the COVID crisis and onwards. So in the United States, we have a situation where the expenditure exceeds the collection of taxes by around two trillion a year. So they're collecting, let's say, four trillion a year in taxes. That's very rough and ready. They're spending around six trillion and that's rising. So the gap the budget deficit, or the deficit, if you like, is getting wider. It's exceeding, the, the deficit is exceeding the official budget. 
and the the problem with the government uh, debt, and we're coming back again to interest rates, is that the interest rates, when the government borrows money, the treasury, that's the treasury in this case, when the treasury borrows money, the interest rate is much higher than it was over the last decade. Because over the last decade, you could borrow money at one or two or, or eventually three percent. Now they're having to borrow money at four or five. Well, it's four four point six percent if you like. If you take the ten year, so they're having to borrow at a much higher rate of interest and that means that the interest cost is rising rapidly as a percentage of everything the government spends i i think it's around 14 percent of the government expenditure at the moment but that's right that that's double what it was a year ago so the interest cost is rising rapidly and within a decade and probably this decade if things carry on as they are the interest cost will exceed the totality of all the taxes collected by the United States each year. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and similar institutions like First Republic Bank marked 2023 as the most turbulent year for the banking sector since the 2008 crisis. However, amidst this upheaval, many small community banks remained relatively unaffected. Sheila Baer, former chair of the U.S. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, warns that the earnings of regional banks could reveal significant vulnerabilities. Her cautionary note comes amid the recent surge in the benchmark 10-year Treasury note yield, which surpassed 4.6% and reached its highest level since November 2023. Are there any potential systemic risks associated with the looming banking crisis of 2024? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. If you found this content helpful, give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe to stay updated. Thank you for being a part of this journey with us.